Hi, welcome to TreeStuff.com's webinar on plant uh, healthcare bracing and support. Uh, we're here live from Indiana and Los Angeles, California with Nick Correa. My name's Nick Bonner and uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna let Nick kind of take over here and tell you a little bit about what we're gonna do. Nick, welcome, thanks. Talk us through it. All right, all right. so before we go, before we jump into it, can you all hear me okay? Everything's good? Uh-oh. Uh oh. What's going on here? Oh, okay. I can hear you. Everything's fine? Yeah, everything's good, I think. Okay, good. Um, all right. Hey, everybody. We are going to talk about uh, supporting trees today. And we do a lot of work pruning trees and sometimes injecting and fertilizing and, and cutting them down if they have to be. Uh, but there's a lot of trees that can be saved That's and awkward. we can save money that can be made um, by doing propping, cabling and uh, bracing trees that are maybe a little more towards the risky side and we'll talk about ways to determine what is a good candidate tree and uh, how to go about saving that tree. So um, when we get into the cabling part of things we're going to talk about dynamic cabling using synthetic material versus steel cabling uh, with obviously steel material. Uh, we're going to talk about bracing trees with through rods if they have cracks in the trunk and we'll talk a little bit about uh, propping trees to hold up long horizontal pieces or to maybe even lift pieces to clear walkways or, or things like that. So um, before we jump into the details of doing the work, I wanted to share one book with you and it's something that I bought a few years ago off of Tree Stuff um, that the ISA and ANSI has the a300 guides that tell you about cabling, bracing, guying, and propping. And it's a list just like the ANSI Z133 guidelines that shows you what size cable you should use for what size branch, um, when you should and shouldn't do it. It's very uh, just listing the rules kind of, but the BMP for that, and I think that goes right about there, you guys can see it. This is a really good little book. It costs like 10 or 20 bucks. It's not expensive at all. And it goes into very good detail. And it's more of a how-to to guide you in doing your first few installations. It's something that um, I don't look at every time anymore. But every once in a while, if we're doing something that's a little different than our standard, uh, I can check nice little how-to charts to figure out um, what, what we're doing. So if you've never done cabling or bracing or anything like that before, uh, this is definitely worth the investment. It's a quick read. I think the whole book is 35 pages. So it's really not much, but uh, there's a lot of good information packed in there. So um, let's talk a little bit about some of the tools. The we, so for cabling, we like to have all of our equipment here at our company in one bag. So uh, this is our bag for dynamic cabling. We'll open it up in a minute and see everything that's in there. Uh, and then we have this little guy right here. This is all we need when we're doing steel cable installations. Obviously, the steel cable's not in here, but um, when we're in, all the pieces and tools that we need to do that installation are in here. Um, and it's important, I think, to have those tools ready to go. Uh, on your first few installations, you're probably going to be going to your toolbox and looking for um, a certain tool and then figuring out how to get that up in the tree. But after you've done a lot of cable installations, you realize you're wasting a lot of time going back and forth to the toolbox. So we have everything ready to go in both of these two kits right here um, so that we just grab it, clip it on. It's got a carabiner ready to go so we can clip it on the rope and send it up to the climber. Um, another thing I want to show you is these little snippers right here. When we get into doing steel cable, uh, there are two kinds of cable, and we'll talk about it. We'll go into that right now. There's common grade cable, which you can bend it by hand. If you were to take one of those strands, you could wrap it right around your face. It just feels like wire. Uh, and then what we exclusively use at our company is EHS or extra high strength cable. And uh, the, the important thing to know about those two is EHS is extremely stiff. It doesn't bend, you can't bend it by hand. Uh, and the 
common grade, you can cut it with just about anything. Uh, a, a gentle pair or a weak pair of wire snip snippers or diagonal pliers will cut through it, but um, EHS won't do it. So it won't cut that easy. These guys are made by the Nipex brand. Uh, my friend Pat Wisniewski taught me about these. And this particular one is 7122200. And uh, it has an angled head on it. And when we get into the demonstration of the rig guy uh, wire stop, you'll see how that angled head will allow you to get in and cut nice and close to the, uh, to the wire. Um, to the, the wire stopper uh, without leaving these long, ugly tails. So um, the other thing you're going to need are some really long drill bits. And the bigger the trees are, the longer the drill bits will have to be. Uh, we keep all of ours in a, a little PVC tube right here. And it's just this piece is glued permanently. And this guy down here is a cap that pops off. and. I don't, I don't know if this will pop, if this will show, um, but ours are all color coded. So this little tiny guy right here, it's got some yellow paint on it right there. I think you can see that. But the yellow paint, that yellow drill bit, matches up with this spool of wire right here, which we have marked with uh, some yellow webbing. So our guys know if we're doing a small tiny tree. It's, uh, that's all the yellow stuff, and they'll grab the yellow wire, uh, the yellow cable, excuse me, the yellow drill bit, and for us, we'll use the wire stoppers, the rig guy wire stoppers, and also color coded. So in this bag, I have the blue ones. You can see that blue right there. And uh, down at the bottom of the bag is where we have the, yeah, the yellow ones are in here somewhere, but those are the little tiny ones. But taking that time when you're managing a crew, uh, can be a really good investment. Um, oh, I'm getting something from, uh, yeah, what's going on? <laughs> okay. Well, you know what? Let's stop right there. Uh, so Bonner, they can't hear that. Okay. So that's a really good point. Um, somebody just shared, and I, I can't see who it is, but somebody just shared, if it needs a cable, it needs to be removed. And I'm going to assume you're joking when you say that. You're saying it in jest. But that is a mindset that a lot of arborists have. And um, there is definitely some credence to it in the sense that when you're cabling a tree, you're not so much managing the tree as you are managing the risk that that tree represents. And a lot of and a lot of have uh, very low risk tolerance, and those people tend to not have big trees around their property. Um, and so when I go to meet with somebody uh, about their tree, and we identify something that either I noticed, or maybe they noticed that it was opening up in the wind, um, um, we can talk to what the cable can actually do. And uh, we always make it clear to them that Cables aren't bulletproof. Uh, they're not guaranteed to stop damage. They increase the likelihood that the tree can re can hold itself together. And uh, in the event of a failure, the event of a failure, it inks the likelihood that the broken piece will stay up in the tree. There's no promises, and um, we can apply the best of our knowledge and our experience to someone that uh, wants zero risk. Uh, the only way to manage that is to get rid of all of their trees. So um, if you do need to cable it and they are willing to understand the limitations of what the cable or brace can do, uh, then that's a great opportunity for you to make a client for life. And um, you won't make as much money installing a cable as you will removing the tree, but uh, you can make uh, that money over time, managing the tree with them, pruning it over time, uh, perhaps installing more cables if that needs to be done. Um, I live in a very litigious community here in Los Angeles, and people are much more ready to cable a tree or to uh, to prop it or something like that because they don't want to get sued. And um, we talk with them about what what that cable will mean for them. And a lot of folks see it as a really great balance between um, keeping the tree and reducing the risk. Um, so anyways, uh, so 
as I was saying, all our things are color coded to minimize errors within the crew. If you're doing it all yourself and you're only ever installing one size cable, uh, maybe you'll decide for your trees in your neighborhood, um, in your community, that uh, you can look in the chart and see that I think quarter inch cable will be the best kind for me. Then you only need one drill bit um, and one size of hardware to install that cable into the trees. Um, uh, you're going to need a drill to drill uh, the holes with, obviously. And there are, I guess there's three options. There's really two. One of them is a, an a electric plug-in, but that's really goofy to be running a cable you know, up a tree. Uh, so nowadays, the battery-powered ones are so good that we don't need to mess around with uh, the electric. Um, so we use the Milwaukee M28 series uh, is the one that we really like. Uh, it is a hammer drill, so sometimes we need to drill into concrete to um, install a, a prop that's going to get anchored into a concrete that's below the tree. So this will allow us to drill that, but predominantly this is used for drilling holes. Uh, the longest ones we've done were about four feet long, and it takes a while to do it, but uh, even an electric drill will do it. So um, obviously you have to not lose the batteries and make sure you don't leave the charger at the client's website or at the client's job site. But, um, so you'll have to make a decision about what that, uh, how that's going to be for you. The gas powered drills are powerful, but they're gigantic and it's really not necessary for most cabling. When you get into installing props, uh, which excuse me, when you get into installing uh, braces and through rods in trees, that's where a lot of folks might decide to step up to a uh, gas power drill. But um, for most cabling, if you're starting at this, you're going to be really happy with uh, an, an electric powered uh, drill. Get the strongest one. If you don't have one already, get the strongest one you can afford. Um, and then uh, you're going to need a come along of some sort. And as arborists, as climbers, most of us have enough tools in our gear bag already to put that together without having to buy a specialized piece of equipment. And uh, that's what we did for a, a long time until we eventually bought one single purpose that sits in that bag and waits for, for, uh, for us to need it. So um, I think that is everything that we need. Um, so let's go straight into, oh, oh, yeah, we'll go straight into the cabling now. And I think we're gonna do the steel cable first because that's what we've been talking about more and then uh, we will go into the dynamic cable so um, I'm just looking at my notes here off screen uh, so there are a few basic systems or a few um, layouts and how you can install a cable into a tree and the basic one is just two branches a co-dominant tree uh, and you're just running one cable <laughs> All right, Ricardo, that's a really good point to make sure that the ground guy doesn't leave with the cabling equipment in the back of the pickup truck. I don't know if he's ever actually experienced that maybe on our job site with Tree Care LA, and that's what he's referencing. Um, but when you're installing a cable system, it starts prior to the crew showing up to do the install. You're going to be meeting with the client uh, beforehand and maybe they know about it maybe you're finding the issue but the moment you identify the tree that you think may be a good candidate for a cable or maybe in need of a cable uh, the conversation goes directly um, to the client on whether or not they're willing to accept that some people don't want to pay the money to have it installed and then you can tell them okay I just you know I've warned you about it and I'm gonna send you an email just so I can cover my tracks um, uh, but once you realize you have a tree that's a good candidate to be cabled and you have a client that is a good candidate to receive a cable uh, now we have to start designing that system in our head and for me we have um, two Oh yeah, that's a good idea, Nick. Thank you. Nick's talking to me in my ear right here to give me some ideas. So um, the candidates, what what is it that I'm looking for when I see a tree? And and I know a lot of you know the the 
the main buzzword is co-dominant stems. And that's the biggest thing that we're looking for. Uh, I think a good example would be, let's say, a white pine, which is a common tree throughout the United States. Uh, in Southern California, we don't have white pines, but we have Canary Island pine, which is very similar. Strong X current form, straight up with the branches coming off the trunk. Uh, but every once in a while, you get one of those branches that back in time started growing upwards. And if 50 years goes by or 30 years go by and that branch keeps growing upward, you end up with a Y-shaped, uh, slingshot-shaped tree. And uh, yeah, so you should see those graphics right there. And um, in an X-current tree, the branch unions, I'm gonna explain it to you the way that I explain it to clients when they wonder, uh, why do I need to cable my tree just because it's codominant? Uh, here's the, the analogy that I give to them. I explain that in an X current tree, the central trunk is the leader. That's, that's our leader and we're trying to maintain that leader. And when the tree was really little, uh, if we notice one of those branches starting to curve up, we could just snip it off right there. And the, the trunk will keep growing upwards and it will remain the leader at all times. In a co-dominant, uh, excuse me, in, in a tree where a limb connects to the trunk, if it is a subordinate limb, meaning it's thinner and shorter than the parent stem, uh, there's a really good subordinate, uh, excuse me, subordinate and leadership relationship. And you, we know that trees get another uh, growth, uh, excuse me, a new, a new growth ring every year. And what a lot of clients don't know, and you can see their face when you tell it to them, and I'll say, did you know that branches also get another annual ring every year? And you sometimes you see their faces go, oh, yeah, I guess that makes sense. They didn't, they never really thought about that. And then I can point to the place where those two growth rings come together. And the way I describe it, even though this isn't exactly what's happening, the leader is kind of saying, hey, I'm gonna lay down my ring right here, and then I want you to set yours on top of me. And then next year I'll lay down another one on top of you, and then you lay yours on top of me. In a codominant stem, um, the the one that maybe should be the leader is saying, "Hey, I'm going to lay my growth ring down, and then you put yours on top of me." And the other one goes, "Oh no 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 no! I want to be in charge here. I'm going to put mine down, and then you." go on top of me. And they're kind of trying to take control over the situation. And what ends up happening is rather than meshing together and getting stronger and stronger year after year as that limb gets longer and heavier, there's more leverage being pushed on it. Um, instead of getting stronger, those growth rings are not meshing together, but they're bumping up against each other. And over time, those growth rings start pushing outwards. And, and at that point, I do this motion with my, with my knuckles and when you look at it sideways, then point to the codominant stem that has some included bark, and you can see that protrusion where the included bark is, and it makes this sort of a shape. Um, and, and it really helps them to visualize what's going on inside the tree. And then, you know, it has to be a little doom and gloom here where we explain that over time, that internal pressure increases and there is a breaking point where one day one of them is going to push the other one out. And we don't know if that's going to happen in 10 years or 50 years. Um, but what we do know is that when there's a huge windstorm, the things that fail most often are dead trees and uh, co-dominant trees, large co-dominant trees that have been left unchecked for a long time. So that cable for not a huge price um, can do a really good job of uh, reducing the client's risk. And if they do want to take the risk, I'll point out that, you know, maybe it's out in an open field and that whole codominant, maybe it's 50 feet long, it could fall in the field. And then I tell them the cleanup of that limb is going to cost more than the cost of the cable. So it, there's a lot of reasons why it's worth it for them to uh, do a little bit of an investment to manage that. Uh, the more urban and more impacted your uh, environment is the more important it is for those trees to be cabled because there's more damage that could be caused uh, as opposed to a very rural area so um, whoa all right so Nick Bonner has just given me a clever idea here and we're gonna offer an opportunity for you guys to call in live 
and ask a question and I'll answer it directly. So I'm gonna give you Nick Bonner's personal cell phone. Is that correct, Nick? Oh boy. So you um so Nick Bonner's personal cell phone number, if you guys write this down, 440-989-0444. If you have a question you want to ask me directly, um, and we're kind of going no, no limits here. We don't have to stick to a very particular script. I have some things we're going to cover, but um, call in or maybe text Nick that question, but you can call him in directly and, and uh, we'll answer it. And I just got a photograph that was emailed. Oh. That's just a photo of me. Come on, why are you guys sending me that picture? <laughs> um, okay, so that addresses when we might do a cable um, and how kind of the train of thought that I follow. Uh, then the other situations where we might do a cable are uh, no phone calls yet. Somebody get on the phone and call Nick Bonner. I'm going to say that phone number one more time. Uh, we need to get we need to get uh, his phone blowing up. Uh, oh, if people are watching it on their phone, is that the problem? Uh, 440-989-0444. Um, so anyway, someone will call in. That'll be a neat little thing we can do. Uh, the other times that we find ourselves cabling trees are long horizontal limbs. And it's usually the result of previous tree pruners lions tailing a tree for way too long and so we'll end up with these long horizontal limbs going over the house or over the driveway over a walkway and they now because of their uh, so put together out to the end and going up to one of the um, diagonals going over it or maybe two or three of them depending on the loads that we're talking about here uh, so that we can share the leverage on that limb. Okay, let's see how this is going to work. We're going to try to go live to another person. Uh, who Caller, what's your name and where are you from? Uh, Dan Carter, Marquette, Michigan. What's, what's up, up Dan? Dan? Hey, not too much. Just had a question for you guys. Okay. Um, when you're setting up rigging for cabling and stuff, do you have to be careful what time of the year, like with, especially with the oak trees with the oak well? Um, open up a wound. Oh, oh yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. That's, That's a really, a really good, good question. question. Can, can, uh, uh, hey, hey Bonner, Bonner, can, can everyone, everyone else hear the, hear the question? question, or should I repeat it? No, I think I think the whole world can can hear you and Dan conversing. I'm I'm holding my phone on oh, speakerphone awesome. up to my microphone. Okay, that's cool that that worked. Um, that's a really good question, and the answer to your question is absolutely definitively yes. Um, when you cable a tree, as part of the process, you have to bring two limbs close together, and a lot of times it's hundreds or thousands of pounds of force that is being um, used to bring those limbs together. And we all know that a climber alone can cause damage to the cambium of a tree um, just under their own weight. So if you amplify that through a, uh, a pulley system of some sort, you can easily scar the tree. So for us at our company, we know the trees in our area that are more susceptible to that, and um, we can cushion the rigging slings if we need to. Um, and so, oh, well, luckily we don't, we don't have to deal, deal with it in Southern, Southern California, California. Yeah. yeah, but it's, but it's a, a very, very easy to transmit, transmit disease, disease, and, and it would it make, would make a, lot a lot of sense, sense uh, to to protect those limbs uh, as you're bringing those limbs together. That's a cool question, though. Um, does that make sense? Does that seem reasonable? Yeah, for sure. Cool. Anything else? No, that's it. Hey, Dan, right, thanks for right. watching, and thanks for calling. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Have a good one. I feel like I'm on the radio. I know. I know. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, uh, we, we should go, go to the prize class and get Dan, get Dan a prize, prize for being the first guy to call in. in. Um, Oh, you, uh, do you have a prize for Dan? Or are there giveaways on sure. this, on this you know webinar? What? Yeah, there, there are. are. In, In fact, fact, I have, I have this steel rope, rope right, right here. here. Oh. And it's three quarter inch dynamic cable. And uh, Nick, can you tell us a little bit about this rope? That's the, uh, the notch dryad. So it's a 12 strand hollow braid, uh, dynamic cable basically. And uh, you're gonna teach us how to use it, but it's got a little yeah, bit of a, of a camo thing going on. And uh, it's, it's yeah, very good so stuff. We will send, uh, I think we got, how long is this spool? Is this 300 feet right here, right? It's a 300 uh, so foot spool. Out, 
six 50 foot pieces as samples and uh dan will be the first one to get one so uh uh, that'll be cool. And when you're dealing with oak wilt, the dynamic cable might be a good way to keep those loads minimized. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that a little more later. All right, Dan, um, I'm going to let you so go, and we're going to switch the audio back over to Nick so we don't have any problems. Thanks for calling in, Dan. Okay, Thanks, Dan. Well, message message uh, one of these guys your address so we can get you the 50 feet of uh, dynamic cable. Um, all right, so... Following our train of thought here, we have identified that the tree could use a cable or a brace or a prop. And, um, hey, Nick, did I just lose you? Oh, I think I did. Just call me back. I'll connect. Um, we've identified that the tree is ready for it. We've identified that the tree is ready, uh, the client is ready for it. All right, I got gotcha. you. Um, and now we have to figure out, well, what is it that we're actually going to do? And my train of thought, what I'm looking for in the tree, uh, it's kind of a pyramid or you know a chart, a flow chart of decisions I have to make. And the first one is uh, what are we installing? Cables, braces, or props? And right now we're going to focus on cables and braces because those two usually go hand in hand, whereas the prop can be an independent uh, thing. So uh, we've identified it needs a cable. Now I'm checking out the base of the tree to determine if it needs if I think it needs uh, some through rods or braces and um, uh, to d make that determination, if it's opening up, if the co-dominant of the included bark is so strong in there that it's starting to callus over on the inside and it's actually opening up uh, immediately, yes, it needs a brace. If they're gonna retain that tree, and I know that sounds really scary to a lot of people, and a lot of folks will say that tree should absolutely be, be removed. Um, but you will come one day, you'll come across a tree that they'll tell you that removal is not an option. That shades my kid's swimming pool or this is a historic tree or, or um, something that I have a feeling most of you don't deal with. Uh, but we have clients in L.A. that use their, their personal homes uh, to do filming of movies and stuff like that and they know that the tree is part of their income for their house because uh, the the studios you know the director likes seeing that big beautiful tree uh, so when removal isn't an option even if you see a co-dominant limb opening up it tells me all right we're putting cables up there and we're putting some braces in here so um, so when we're talking about the braces I have to decide what diameter braces and we keep a whole bunch of them here in stock and they're just big giant steel all thread rods nothing too fancy um and we keep a whole bunch of sizes of them uh and then i need to know oh and in case you're wondering one second in case you're wondering those are all color coded too um so we need to know how many and what size and then where are they going to go and uh, the really good thing is that, Carson, can you put up that chart that I sent you um, in the BMP? Uh, I've got these little tabs here. And one of them shows a chart. And it's a really good chart. It's not perfect. But uh, there's a chart here that shows the diameter of the branch. And we'll just pick on one and say if it's an 8, the diameter below the junction. If it's 8 to 14 inches, and that's kind of small, if it's about that big around, it tells me that we should use um, half inch rod and honestly uh, that's a good level for beginner brace installers uh, buying those drill bits is something that you can buy off of tree stuff or or sometimes locally at a hardware store uh, a 14 inch long drill bit is not that long uh, it's definitely doable um, and it tells you you need uh, two of them or one of them depending on whether it's split open or if it's just a tight union. And so it's a good guideline. It talks you through it. It makes it easy for you. Uh, when you get to big giant things, it says if it's greater than 40 inches in diameter below the union, then it'll be seven eighths inch diameter um, uh, rod and that you need to use four of them plus one for every eight inch increment above 40 inches. So if you do that math, if it's a four foot diameter limb, that's 48 inches. So we need to do four for the first 40 inches and throw in one more somewhere 
uh, because it's 48 inches in diameter. Um, and uh, so that chart alone is worth the price of admission for this book. Uh, it's a guideline. You will encounter situations where you can't fit that many on the tree or, um, or you think you need more than that. In time, as you start looking at trees for support systems, your mind starts seeing things that you never really noticed before and you'll develop an eye on what a certain tree will need so um up in the tree now we've talked about whether or not we're going to put braces in there i have to make some decisions about the cables the decision making process for me is dynamic or steel and dynamic is if i recognize that it's co-dominant but it's not gigantic not large Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see if, if anyone has any questions about, uh, pro, uh, <laughs> about bracing a tree, about putting a through rod. We haven't talked about the process of actually doing that yet. We're going to demonstrate it in a minute. Um, but anyone have any questions, just call them in while I get started talking about the cabling. Um, and, uh, and then we'll go to it. Um, yeah, just put the questions in the chat feed underneath, um, right under here. We got one question. Let's hear it, Nick. So our question is from Christopher Barkman. Uh, Chris wants to know when we're installing steel rods on top of one another, what vertical distance should be considered to reduce or minimize excessive barrier zone development? Ooh, that's a really good question. <clears throat> and I guess we will, um, well, let's go into it right now then. Uh, there are some guidelines, and they're also in that book. They'll tell you real clearly. And they're, we're usually using a trunk diameter as a unit of measurement for how far apart these things should be. So if you have a 12-inch trunk, which would be very small, if you're putting two of them, uh, keep them 12 inches apart from each other. Um, as the trunk diameter gets bigger, they can be they don't have to be a full trunk diameter away, um, but at a minimum, make sure you have at least a 12 inch gap. And uh, as, the dis as the diameter of the trunk gets bigger, they can be closer, but not closer than 12 inches. If you're doing a six inch tree, don't let them be six inches, uh, any closer than six inches. Uh, and then the orientation of the multiple rods is really important. If you have a straight co-dominant tree and you put four of them in right below each other, you're, uh, what Chris is hinting at here is that you're actually um, making it easier for the decay from every rod to reach each other and, and you can in a way perforate the grain of the tree and you can cause it, instead of it splitting this way, you can cause damages of it splitting open that way. So the way we address that is putting all the rods in at different angles, slightly to each other. One coming in this way, one going 15 degrees that way, and one going that way. Um, and by keeping them spaced out from each other and at different angles, uh, we can strengthen the overall force of the through rod, but we can also uh, minimize the damage that the decay is gonna do to the tree. Awesome. And that's an important thing we have to keep in mind that when we're making the decision to put metal inside a tree, we are making an opportunity for decay to go into that tree. And um, when I do that here in Los Angeles, let's say I'm looking at a big Chinese elm tree, um, they love the tree. We acknowledge that there's a defect that needs to be addressed. A decision will be made, <clears throat> excuse me, a decision will be made that if we don't address it, maybe we have to cut the tree down right now. So we can go ahead and put, drill some holes, put some metal in there, and that might speed up how long uh, the decay issues, how quickly that would happen. But the alternative is doing nothing and waiting for the tree to fail. So even though we are inviting opportunities for decay, uh, we are creating opportunities for trees to last longer uh, in the landscape. And that's the whole point of all of this, is stretching out the timeline, the useful life of that tree to that property. Uh, eventually a day will come where we'll all look at it and say, 
ah, we, you know, it's time. There's nothing else we can do anymore. This tree is structurally a mess and it can't be improved. So that's when we'll finally cut it down. But these pieces of metal can buy us decades sometimes. So um, we got another question. Let's hear it. Jo Joseph Mitchell wants to know uh, if we're talking about installing through the union or above the union. And I think that's a, an important thing to, to point out. Yeah, that's a good question, Joseph. Uh, the answer is both, and it will de depend on the scenario. So if you're only putting one and it's a small tree, maybe it's a you know 10 inch diameter tree, it should go just above that union. Um, if you're putting multiple, then one of them will, usually one of them will be just above the union, uh, and then everything else will stagger in below that. Um, yeah. All right. So let's go. Uh, let's go to. Let's look at some cabling stuff right now, and then we'll do some demonstrations in a little bit. <clears throat> um, all right. So if I see a, a co-dominant stem and where they come together, it doesn't look that bad. Uh, it's not split open, and the loads up top are not crazy but i know that that neighborhood that part of town gets a lot of wind and it makes sense to add some support this is a good opportunity to put dynamic cable um oops excuse me all right it's rope it's just rope it doesn't drill into the tree uh it doesn't cause any damage to the tree it does change the dynamic of how it moves and the way i explain it to uh to our potential clients is that um you think of a wishbone and as you're pulling on it to break it, there's a force that it takes, and maybe it's 20 pounds of force. And if you and I could just agree to never pull harder than 20 pounds, then the wishbone will never break. And trees operate in the same way. As the wind is pushing on it, it's moving in all different directions. And in each direction, it can handle a certain force. And maybe it's 10,000 pounds or 2,000 pounds, whatever it is. Um, when we make the decision to put a piece of dynamic cable in the tree, we're telling the tree, we like that you're moving. We want you to keep moving. We know that you get stronger as you move, but we also know that you might get close to that breaking point. So we're going to install a cable. It's going to be slack, and uh, it's going to let you move. But when the wind really picks up, it's going to kind of say, whoa, buddy, let's hold up right there, and, and it'll stop you from going past that breaking point. That's the idea there. Some trees, um, if the defect is worse, or if the loads are so high that you don't want it to be moving anymore, or perhaps it's a very brittle type of a tree, uh, that's when we go with steel cable. Steel cables are always in, installed tight, uh, taut, so that we're very quickly, immediately limiting the movement of that tree, um, even in no wind. So um, let me look at my notes here and see what else we're, we're missing. Um, whoa! Um, I just heard there are over a hundred people watching this right now. That's crazy. They make, you guys are making me nervous. Uh, so let's talk about, um, all right, I've acknowledged, let's say I'm going to do uh, a dynamic cable in this particular tree that we're talking about. We're not doing any braces on this one. And it's not just a plain, simple, basic codominant system, um, which in when you're looking in the books, they'll call that a direct cable when it's just one, uh, or maybe there's three of them and one giant one and then two smaller ones, and you can do two direct legs coming off the big one out to the two little ones. Um, but maybe it's, uh, this isn't really a word, but I call it tri-dominant, where there's three of them that all come up and split apart, uh, or four or five or, or many more. Then you have to make the decision if you're going to go with a box system where the cables go all the way around and it's, I think of it as like a hug. Uh, it's not going around the limbs, but it's going from limb to limb. And as one of them moves, the other ones all lean in that direction. So it, it, it hugs them all together and they start to move in one, uh, more like one piece. Then the other option, if you're not doing a box system, is what we call a hub and spoke system. And that is, uh, you may remember the photo that was used to advertise a system where we had a metal ring that had five holes in it, and then one cable going out to the main stem of, of each tree. Uh, that's a hub and spoke system. Tree stuff sells a, a, a little 
um, wire stopper that's designed for a three hub system. It's a great little piece of metal um, that just got three offset holes that head in different directions. And if you need something different, uh, when we're doing a larger tree that has a bunch of different limbs, uh, we can call uh, Rig Eye, the manufacturer of the wire stops, and they'll custom make them for us. And they're not expensive. I, I can tell you that uh, the one in that picture, I think we paid like 75 bucks for it. And to do a custom piece, you know, a piece of metal with holes right where we wanted them, uh, on that particular one, one of the holes was offset because one of the limbs was closer. It wasn't perfectly spaced, and they were able to match that for us if we gave them the measurements. Um, I think that's really cool that we have that option available. Uh, and it, it really shows a high level of dedication. Your client can see that you're making sure this is getting done right. Um, so I personally prefer the hub and spoke systems for one primary reason, and, and I'll explain it um, by looking at how the box system is set up. When you install one cable, you have a hole on each side of the tree, one over here, one over here. And if this limb over here has another cable, you can't use the same hole. You have to drill another hole going from here to that limb over there. So if it's five leads that are all getting cabled together, you have to drill 10 holes in the tree to do that. The hub and spoke system allows you to install one end of the cable in the middle of the tree in, in midair, so you're cutting down the damage to the tree in half. And I think that's a really cool, uh, a really cool setup. The other good thing about the hub and spoke is it allows the tree to move a little more naturally. Um, the pieces can move a little bit laterally uh, where the hub and, excuse me, the box style setup, it does a better job of stopping the pieces. So if I need to stop big giant pieces from moving, then we're going to go to a, a box style setup. Um, so that, I think that about uh, wraps that part up. We'll go, let's talk uh, about steel cabling and then we'll do a demonstration of that. Uh, I, I mentioned before that there are the two options of common grade versus uh, um, versus extra high strength. At our company, we have made the decision to only carry extra high strength. Uh, common grade is way easier to work with, but extra high strength, as the name implies, it's way stronger. So um, we make our crew make me do more work, but give a better result. And it costs more um, because of it. But um, we carry three different sizes in-house um, for us. The 3 8 is the biggest size we carry. We go 3 8 1 quarter, and then 3 16 which is used for ornamental, little tiny stuff. But um, 3 8 uh, has a breaking strength of, I think it's like 11,000 pounds. It might be 13,000. I have to look that one up. But you guys can look it up. You're online right now. But that's what we'll use for big, giant eucalyptus trees with fat leaders on them. Uh, and then medium-sized stuff, obviously, we go with the... Um, what we call cable blue, that's the quarter inch cable, and the three eighths is cable red. So if you look at one of our quotes, it, it's all broken down. When the crew looks at it in the morning, they know that they're installing red cable. They can grab the red spool, make sure they got the red drill bit and the red rig guy wire stops and they're ready to go. Um, uh, so that steel cable is being used to actively support the load at all times. We're trying to res restrict movement here. And then the the other thing um, you have to figure out is that there are different ways to terminate that steel cable into the branch. And I think we'll start some demonstrations. Um, the two most common right now are uh, using the preformed uh, pre wrap cable grips. Uh, and we're going to switch to Nick in a minute, and he's going to demonstrate how that works. That uses uh, J lags and thimbles. Uh, and then the other one is the rig guy wire stop, and that's the one that I prefer. And so, so we're going to switch over to Nick. He's going to demonstrate the the pre wrap technique, and then we'll switch back to Nick, and we're going to demonstrate the uh, the rig guy wire stop. All right, hey everybody, I'm Nick, uh, live from Indianapolis. Uh, thank you, Nick. Um, You're welcome, Nick. Here I've got some of the uh, the three sixteenths EHS. Uh, I'm a big fan of the EHS. Common grade cable, uh, I don't know that I agree, is, is easier to work with necessarily. Um, <laughs> you can, however, hand splice it 
so it doesn't require the use of a, of a tool like this. Nick's going to talk a little bit about rig eyes here in a minute, but uh, I'd like to show you this. So um, here I have a 3 8 inch J-lag. Um, I'm sure someone will notice that I'm, I'm going to come out of the back of the tree here. But I went ahead and drilled a hole, uh, slightly smaller than the lag. I put the lag in and then I, uh, I went and started, started turning it. Now I want to make sure that as I go to sink this down that I don't close it all the way. A handy tip if you have another J-lag with you, you can use the J-lag to turn it like I am here. So I'm getting pretty close. Um, I'm going to make sure that I have a thimble here. I'm going to go ahead and put that on. Makes tightening it down a little bit more difficult. And you'll tighten this until you see it kind of start to scratch the bark, but not scratch the cambium. It's a little, little nub there. I make sure to always position the J-lag down uh, when I can because they're stronger that way. As you pull on it, it won't cause the, the lag to, to open up in as many situations because it'll leverage down into the tree. But in any event, once you have the J-lag set with your thimble on it, you're gonna go ahead and take your preform. Take it off my piece of cable here. And you're gonna seat that around the thimble. Now, <clears throat> we're assuming that I'm doing the first end of the cable here. So I'll take the end of the cable and I'll seat it right at the, the end or the beginning, whichever way you look at it, of the preform. And you just need to snap it in there and give it a quick little start. And then you just wrap this around like that. I hope you guys can see that there. And then what I'll usually do is wrap it about halfway and then go ahead and do the other side of it. And you wrap the opposite direction. And what that does is it forms a connection that is as equally strong as the cable. So these are very, very strong. They don't slip, uh, they do decay and and you know, they oxidize and, and rust and, and have been known to fail, but um, that's only after a very long time. And uh, this is a great choice. It's quick and easy to do. Uh, once I've determined that this is exactly where I want it, I'm gonna go ahead and close this, but I'll talk a, a little bit about a, a neat trick you can do with these. If you need to set up a pull line on your cable or bring the cable up in the tree, installing it halfway like this is a really easy way to do that. It's still very strong um, and it can be undone. So. If I were to come over here and need to, to winch this side or use a come along to tension it, I could install another preform right here and pull this closer to my other anchor and then go ahead and attach it and then lay off and then remove the preform on the middle and use that again. But once I've decided that this is exactly where I want it, I'm gonna go ahead and completely finish wrap one side of it all the way to the end. And I'm gonna make sure that I get this to click on the end here. That's a a careful point that you want to make sure you pay attention to. Once I've done that, I'm going to wrap the other side all the way around. And again, you want to make sure that you get all of those strands to flip over it and completely close and form a nice, neat, clean termination like that. Uh, once you've done that, this side is complete. It's done. So you go ahead and move over to the other side of the tree, uh, pre-tension, and then install uh, the preform on the other side and you'd be all finished. You, you, you happy with that, Araya? Was that up to your standards at Tree Care LA? Yes, that would be sufficient. Uh, but it's not a rig guy, so I, I won't like it as much. But uh, the way you did it was textbook. Awesome. Looks well, like you've uh, done that before. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to hand it back over to you live from Los Angeles, United States. <laughs> so Nick hinted at something very important there, that the, that pre-wrap eventually will corrode and break down. And some folks will look at that and say that that's a weakness in that system. But the truth is cables do not last forever. They're meant to be observed, uh, inspected occasionally, and um, uh, perhaps redone uh, as the tree keeps growing taller. If it's still growing taller, uh, it'll, it'll need to be moved higher. And if you see a cable that's been in a tree for 15 years or something like that, that alone is reason to replace it. Uh, because 15 years ago, who knows what they were doing. And, and uh, so anyways, um, we are, let me get back to my notes here. 
and oops one second okay uh, so now I'll demonstrate the rig eye system and I have uh, I want to show you one thing you have to make a decision on how once you're up in the tree and you know where the cable is going to go uh, and we'll talk about that in a moment where it's going to go but um, well let's do it right now actually uh, if you're doing a straight codominant just a direct cable and you identified that it needs to be uh, cabled as a general rule that cable should go approximately two-thirds of the way up from the union to the to the top of those two branches um, or those two stems uh, approximately two-thirds of the way up and that's going to depend tree to tree and this is where your uh, personal judgment is really going to as an arborist, it's really going to come into play. Uh, sometimes if you go two thirds of the way up, the, the branches really start going outward to the point where they're almost horizontal and we can't actually put the cable there. So we have to come down a little bit to where they're still kind of going up instead of out. Uh, but, you know, as a general guideline, aim for two thirds of the way. And then typically, if you were to imagine two limbs, uh, if they're coming straight up, the cable is going to be installed horizontally. So those two limbs, imagine a line that goes right down the middle. Uh, the cable will be perpendicular to that line. Now when we're doing uh, that long horizontal limb that's going over a driveway uh, and we're cabling this horizontal limb to this slightly upright limb, uh, we're not putting it in horizontal anymore because you can't do that. So uh, we're imagining the same thing a line coming directly between the two limbs and our cable is going to be perpendicular to that. Another good rule of thumb, if we're doing a horizontal limb, you want that pull to be as straight vertical as possible as long as there's something overhead that can handle the force for you. Um, a straight up pull will be great to lift a horizontal limb uh, if the tree allows for it. Usually that's not doesn't there aren't a lot of branches that come out and all over with enough force to lift up for you so, um, once you're up in the tree and, and you've decided the cable is going to go from right here to right over there uh, you need the piece of cable and you need to make a decision on how much cable you are going to have cut and sent up the tree um, the most common way people do this is uh, you tie a knot uh, oh, let me fix the camera. So we got to go to right there. That that works. All right. Um, if you guys want to uh, ask any specific questions about particular trees, email them to media at treestuff.com. You can do that right now, and uh, we can put those pictures up and we can talk about them uh, as a as a team here. But. Um, we are going to imagine we're cabling to that wall over there. I can take the end of my rope, uh, maybe clip a throw bag onto it or tie a knot, and I can get a good swing on it, and I can mark with my hand when it hits that other limb, and I can tie another knot right here, and I know that it's that long, and I can send that back down um, and tell the crew on the ground, cut a piece of cable that long or cut it two feet longer than that, depending on how you're doing uh, your, your installation. Um, uh, depending on the layout of the tree, you might be able to climb up the tree, set your rope, climb down, and uh, anchor off the end of the rope there, swing over real quick to get the measurement, and then swing back, tie the knot and throw it down. Um, that's too much work for me, and I don't like guesswork, so I use a, a laser measurer I don't let our crew use it because they drop things sometimes, but when I'm the one doing the cabling, uh, I can point over there and it'll tell me that it's 19.2 inches, uh, excuse me, 19 feet over there. And then for me, uh, I have to add the, because I'm doing the rig guy system, which goes through the tree, uh, I have to add, let's say it's 12 inches on each side and then a little more. So if it says 19.2, I'll add two feet for each side. So that's going to be 23 feet. I'll tell the guys on the ground, coming at 23 feet piece of cable and uh, they'll get that taken care of and sent up um, all right so we're going to assume for this little demonstration that I've already done that side and now I'm doing the final side over here um, so the first thing I need to do 
is grab my drill and all of our hand tools have a little tether or a, a clip in point so that we can clip our chainsaw lanyard onto it. Um, but I don't need that right now. And uh, we're doing a quarter inch cable, which for us is cable blue. And I don't know if you can see that that's blue right there. So um, so we'll put that in. And what I have to do now is line this up both um, up and down and side to side so that it's pointing directly at where the other cable is coming from. And that sometimes can be the trickiest part uh, drilling a hole is not hard. I mean, everybody can handle that. But sometimes you're up in the tree and and like the layout of where your rope is, you know you want to be right here when you're drilling it so you can get behind it and look and see what you're doing and you can't always get behind it. So you might be like this, kind of oh, trying to look over it down in every direction and, and do what you can. Um, so Hey Nick, I'm going to bust in here as you're drilling. Uh, there was a question from the chat, uh, how to reduce bit binding. So maybe that's something that you can talk about. Um, yeah. yeah. They were asking about 40 inch plus bores, but, uh, which I know yes. you're not doing now, but if you could just talk about a little bit about bit binding and the need to pull the bit out even when installing J-Lags, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? Bit bind uh, is, a, is a huge problem when you're drilling long holes, um, 40 inches or something like that. And here are the few things I figured out. One, uh, the longest bit, it kind of gets, I want to say like war tired or something, just things getting gummed up in it while you're drilling those holes. So if you're drilling a 40 inch hole, don't plan for that to take 10 minutes. It's going to take a while. Give yourself a lot of time to drill that hole and don't try to do it all with one bit. Uh, if we're uh, doing a seven eighths inch hole, uh, that's 14, 16. So you're going to be using a 15, 16 drill bit. Have a 12 inch drill bit and then a, uh, an 18 inch and then a 24 inch drill bit. And what that allows you to do, uh, you're starting out with the, with the little drill bit, which is real easy to hold. Um, you're only drilling 12 inches in, which we all know 12 inches, no big deal. We can handle that. And um, by the time you pull that 12 inches out, uh, the drill bit's going to be gummed up if it's a pine or, or for us a ficus tree. Um, and then you're taking it off, setting it to the side, and putting on a longer drill bit. And, and then, uh, of course, you're pulsing it as you go, push it in a few inches, take it out to exit those chips, to clear those chips out, and do that over and over and over, and keep working your way up to longer and longer drill bits. If you're doing a 40-inch hole and you have a 48-inch drill bit, if you start out standing four feet that way, that bit is going to be flexing because it's just so heavy and it's hard to manage that that long of a hole. Um, so if you start with those shorter drill bits, by the time you get a long giant drill uh, hole and you're sticking that bit into the tree, most of what you're drilling is supported by the hole you've already. It's a pilot hole, basically. Um, so uh, that'll really help. The other thing uh, that we use is lubricate it somehow. We use uh, bar oil because we carry, um, you have it right up here, the, the steel brand Bio Plus, which is a you know, vegetable-based bar oil. Use something to lubricate it. Uh, beeswax works well. You want to use natural, as much vegetable-based materials as possible because it, it is going inside the tree. So um, uh, anything that you can do to cut down the, uh, the friction is going to be a huge help to you. Um, also, take your time. We tend to want to drill fast and, you know, time is money, but uh, speed equals heat and the heat equals more binding. So uh, the slower you can go, the better. So, all right, I'll drill my hole right here. This one's going to be real easy, except it's maybe a challenge drilling through a, a, a two by six right here. But. When I'm installing the rig guy, at this point, I, I felt it pop through on the other side. You might be able to see it. Uh, I need that hole to be just a hair bigger, so I usually will, or uh, not bigger, but there will be little fibers inside the hole sometimes. So I, I'll bring the, the drill in and out a couple times 
to sort of clean up that hole a little. Okay, so that should make a nice clean hole for me. Um, now, at this point, uh, I have to set up a tensioning system to bring the two limbs together. Um, so for us here at Tree Care LA, that's this bag right here. And normally it hangs on your harness. Let's see, I might be able to just clip this onto my, yeah, we'll set it right here. Uh, and in here, the first thing I'm going to pull out, and it's right at the top of the bag, and that's not a coincidence, is a, a whippy sling that is going to go around that limb, and then we're going to connect this guy to it. And this is a big, long bit of a mess, but it's just a, a very teeny tiny little pulley system. Uh, it is a 3 8 inch diameter rope. It's a sailing rope that has a lot of fuzz on it, so it makes it really easy for you to grab it. Even though it's so skinny, when you pull on it, it feels like you're pulling a 5 8 inch diameter rope because of all that fuzz. It's a lot of, uh, a lot of friction, which is good. And then we have a cable grip on the end of it here, and it's just a little... Uh, these guys are not cheap, but you only need to buy one as long as you never lose it. And that'll grab on to the, uh, the cable for you. We keep our come along, look how tiny this thing is. These are really small pulleys because space is uh, at a premium when we're trying to carry around a small bag, but it can definitely handle the forces that we're uh, dealing with here. Um, and you put the whoopee sling on here. It has to be sort of close to the cable that you're installing. You can't put it too high or else it'll pull the cable upwards. Uh, clip this carabiner to the whoopee sling. And then we're not gonna do it right here, but at this point, we would stretch it out. We normally keep it cinched up so that it doesn't tangle up quite so much. Um, and then at this point, I gotta get out there and slide this onto the cable. And that's tricky too sometimes when you're climbing, but you guys are climbers, you can handle that part. Um, get out there and grab this thing, uh, connect this to the cable, and let me see, I'll go ahead and, and do a, a gentle demonstration here. If I pull too hard, I'll start ripping things out of the walls. Okay, so we're going to stick this cable. Normally that would have been in the hole already. I got distracted. Okay. All right, so that cable comes all the way through the hole. And then now we can... Let's stop. And so I got my uh, cable clamp grabbed onto the wire. We're going to take a quick little break right there. And we're going to look at a couple pictures here. Let me pull up the, uh, the Facebook feed. All right, let's see these other pictures. Yep. All right. So Brendan is showing, oh boy, that's a behemoth of a tree. Um, that's a beautiful tree and obviously a good, really good candidate for at least one cable. And, uh, um, and now that we look at the base of that tree, it looks like it would justify putting a couple of, uh, um, a couple of uh, uh, through rods in there as well. Um, this has a classic example of how that lead on the right in this picture right here arches away from the main canopy. So we're gonna have to break that two thirds rule and put it down lower just before it arches out. Um, but yeah, this is, this is exactly what cabling and bracing is for. And if we were to look at it in just straight dollars, uh, I'm sure you can all imagine the cost of removing that tree. That's a decent sized tree. Brendan Phillips uh, 
maybe you can tell us how big that is. It looks like between those two stems, it's probably a good four feet at the base or something like that. Um, did you quote to remove that tree, Brendan? You you could tell us that price. And, uh, you know, uh, it, hey, Nick, is there any reason why I shouldn't share how much I would charge to cable that tree? Oh, oh okay, all right. So, so Brendan, uh, you could share with us how, if you don't mind, I'll tell you my numbers if you show me yours. Um, but for me, I'm looking at one or maybe two cables up there, but for one cable and two through rods, we would do the one cable for about 400 bucks and the two rods, if they're four feet, if that is four feet at the bottom, um, we're probably talking 600 bucks per rod just because that hole is so gigantic that we have to drill. Uh, a much smaller rod would be, you know, we do some of them for 125 bucks. Oh, cool. Um, Oh, don't cut half that tree off, Brendan. That's a beautiful, beautiful half of the tree. If you cut half of that tree off, uh, you're opening up a gigantic hole right at the base of the tree, and you very well may be increasing the risk factor of that tree rather than uh, diminishing the risk factor. So that's another advantage to uh, supporting trees rather than cutting off big pieces of it. So, um, all right, so we got our... Uh, our hole drilled, the cable is running through the hole, and I have my come along connected onto the cable. So at this point, uh, if it's a tree, if it's a large tree, we reef on this thing as hard as we can. You know, get your feet up here and really pull on it. I'm just going to do a little example because I just have it connected to a shelf over there and it'll fall out if I pull too hard. But as I pull on it, you can see it coming out a little bit right here. Um, we'll stop right there. Yeah, I can see the shelf starting to fall. So, uh, so at this point, I got about six inches of cable sticking out, and inside this bag, we preloaded it. Uh, the ground guys knew that we were doing uh, cable blue today, so inside here, somewhere. Oh, I got I set it out right here. Um, okay, inside here we have a blue rig guy wire stopper and we keep them all taped together. There are three pieces, only two of them are necessary, but we always use all three of them. Um, there is a hex bolt, a conical hex bolt. I'll right, show you the three pieces here. So this is a rubber cap that's gonna go on at the end. Uh, definitely has nothing to do with the strength. It's just to make it look prettier and to keep the loose, sharp ends covered in case you have to climb that tree again. Uh, and then this hex bolt and the cone. And that's the, kind of the, that's all that really holds it all together. So step number one is slide the, the hex bolt on and the cone, the inside of this is conical in shape and the small end of the cone is going to end up going inside so the small hole there's a small hole here and a large one there the small hole goes on first and then we have a pair of pliers right here and the tricky part is not dropping this uh this tiny little cone so i, I can put it back in the bag honestly i usually put it in my mouth and hold on to it while i do this next part it has a little hole on it that i can breathe I'm going to use these pliers here, and it has this kind of opening in the middle. Uh, they're not flat pliers. They're the ones that have um, that kind of opening shape like that. And we're actually going to untwist this cable to open it. Uh, and that is going to go that way. And the tricky part here is making sure that it's untwisting evenly. You should have uh, six strands on the outside and then one straight strand in the middle. The six on the outside should be evenly spaced and uh, and wrapping around that straight piece in the middle. I know a lot of you guys know I'm a, a rope splicer so I like to think of it as a double braid with a core and that straight strand is like the little core in the middle and, um, and then the twisted ones are the cover on the outside. It just helps my brain. So I gotta find that straight one, slide the cone in, and 
we do this funky little maneuver here where this part isn't necessary, uh, but I always do it. I take my pliers and I open them up a little bit, set it against the cone, and then I use these, um, uh, these snippers here as a, a little hammer, and I'm tapping that cone further in. And I know that the camera isn't good enough for you guys to see this, but as I tap it in, you can actually see it all settling into position. And I can make sure that it's set in right, because now that I've done that, these six strands on the outside are perfectly evenly spaced. So uh, we take the straight one, that's this guy right here, and I bend it at an angle. And at that point, this thing is now full strength. Uh, if if it was just about strength, we could stop right here. Um, let me get my, where did I put my safety glasses? Oh, right here. So at this point, make sure you have your safety glasses on, and we have to make seven snips on, on these cables here. So this angled head will let me reach in just a millimeter or two above that cone, and we're gonna pop all of these things off. So we've got those pieces cut off, and there's this one long one right here, and I'm gonna snip that one off. And these pieces, we usually put them back in the bag so they don't end up just falling in the yard. Um, that's a lawsuit waiting to happen if somebody steps on one of those. So make sure you uh, protect those and get them home with you. This goes back in the bag. The little cap is gonna go on over everything and that's what makes it so if you rub against it, it's not gonna slice you open because those little ends are sharp. And now we're gonna get out there and pop, uh, when I pop this off the little cable grabber, um, uh, there's a little rope clamp in there that holds this rope. The whole thing will usually, there we go, it'll fall off. I usually don't have to climb out to get it. And then we take the whole thing down and put it all back in the bag and move on. And so that's all we have to do here. I think it's a clean setup. I like that we are only dealing with, um, we're only dealing with one piece. I mean, technically it's three pieces, but it's only one piece on the cable. Uh, so anyways, that's the rig I set up. Um, hey, Bonner, we have a couple of, oh yeah, let's talk about, uh, coinciding pruning with cabling. Um, if you're pruning a tree, you're acknowledging that we need to manage the risk that this tree represents, and cabling is one way to do that. Uh, we might also need to prune the tree to uh, manage that risk. And, and I use that word might very intentionally. Um, some folks do think that it's a requirement that if you're cabling it, you better be pruning it. But uh, you might be dealing with an older tree that was pruned five years ago and hasn't really grown back all that much in the last five years. Um, so those are two independent things that oftentimes go together, uh, but only when both of them are required. If the tree needs to be pruned, if it's really overloaded, it's extremely dense, there's a ton of dead wood in there, then it's time to get up there and, and open it up a little. Uh, and if you're doing that, prune the tree first, then cable it. Um, you could cable it, then prune it, take a bunch of weight out of the tree, and then your cable cable will go slack, and then you got to do it over again. Um, so, uh, yeah. Oh, my laser measurer. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, a few people are asking about the uh, laser measurer. Um, you can buy these things at Home Depot these days. This one was extremely expensive, but I bought it a decade ago. Uh, I would, I really like this brand. It's the Leica brand. They make cameras and, and lenses and things like that, binoculars. Um, if you buy one of these, you have to make sure you get 
uh, don't get a sonar one. There's a lot of them that have a laser that shows you the direction that it's heading, but it operates by sending a little click sound and then measuring the time for the laser to go out and back. Um, and those are the, the sonar ones are like 20 bucks at Home Depot. Uh, you need an optical one and those have a big giant uh, lens on the front and it's actually flashing the laser 50 times. It happens real fast, you can't even see it. And then it's measuring by speed of light rather than speed of sound. It's much more accurate and it's based on where the laser beam actually is and not where some other random limb is. So the, uh, okay. Tyler Walton has another uh, tree he wants to show us. So let's see it here. Let me grab my iPad. So Tyler says, uh, here you can see what would have been avoided if I had installed a cable in the willow to the left just a bit earlier. I cleaned up the break and the tree is still doing fine, but I wish that I had cabled it sooner. So obviously Tyler had the opportunity to cable this and didn't do it. And now you can, you can talk about what we see here on the screen, Nick. All right. Um, I can't talk about what I see on the screen. It's not loading. It just shows me looking over there. <laughs> Let me see if we can get it fired up. Uh, oh, here we go. Oh my gosh, that is, what a bummer. Look at that big giant hole at the base of that tree. Uh, looks like weeping willow, I'm assuming. Um, and Tyler totally nailed it. If he was able to get out there sooner, he could have very likely could have prevented this from happening. Uh, that's a gigantic tear at the base of that tree and we all know willows aren't that good at uh, compartmentalizing that wound so this really is the beginning of the end for that tree um, and to think that a $300 cable could have saved them the cleanup cost and stretched out the life of their tree um, so uh, that's a really good share thank you Tyler for uh, sending us that one that that's exactly what this is all about. And you can see those two trees together make one big giant canopy and, and now they've lost a part of that canopy um, and eventually they'll lose half of the canopy when they lose the other piece. But um, Okay. Uh, Nick, you had mentioned someone had some pictures to show of uh, some tool storage systems for um, cabling equipment. Okay, just holler at me when you're, oh, okay. All right. Okay, so we're looking at an aluminum pail here uh, and it, oh, that's super cool. Yeah, with all the little slots on the side. Um, and that's exactly what I'm talking about. This is, this system is really customized to serve this purpose and this purpose only. Um, that's a really, really awesome setup. I'm very jealous of your bucket truck that makes cabling a lot easier. Uh, but you can see how he's got those uh, slots for each of the individual tools. Um, yeah, similar to what we have here at Tree Care LA where there are certain pieces that go into certain pouches inside our, our, um, our bag there and it makes it very easy for our crew uh, when they're reaching for something they don't have to look and dig through it they know to feet by feel if they're looking and watching this they can reach in and just grab what they need so uh, that was an awesome picture um, let's go and talk about some dynamic cabling now we'll get this stuff out of the way got a few uh, questions here about the steel cable. Um, let's let's hear them. So uh, when when you're using from Nate Mosley, uh, when you're putting a a cable in, is there a difference between a softwood or a hardwood? Should should there be a greater distance uh, for through bolts, or do, does that make a big difference? Yeah, um, not really. So uh, could everyone else hear that question, Nick? Yeah, okay. Um, there's a little bit of a difference. It's not huge. Uh, what we're talking about here is managing decay. So if we're doing one cable, a direct cable installation, uh, just put the cable where it needs to be. Um, I prefer on trees that decay more. That's a big reason why I like the rig eye system. Uh, there's less of a likelihood of, of the 
the whole lag eventually pulling out. Um, we can put big washers on the backside. Uh, in here in Southern California, we have a type of tree called a coral tree. They're extremely spongy. Uh, they're really soft, and we can put a big, fat, you know, two-inch diameter washer on the backside, and that'll stop this thing from pulling out. Uh, I, J lags don't work real good in that kind of tree. Where you could have an issue is if you have um, you're installing multiple cables in the tree, and if you put them too close to each other. Uh, the holes will, you know, softwood trees tend to decay more. Uh, so um, you want to spread those apart. Again, if you're putting it in at a six inch area, spread them at least six inches apart from each other or more. Awesome. Um, Josh Merwin from South Carolina wants to know, how much tension is too much? I got, <laughs> I got zingers for you here. Yeah, this is, this is a good question. Um, too much tension is too much. That's the only way to really answer that. Um, the the real the real way what you have to watch, listen and feel the tree as you're doing it. Um, we know that there's a point that if you pull so much that things are starting to crack. Uh, that's that's too much. You got to back it off a little bit and then put the cable in. Um, if we're doing giant trees, it's nearly impossible for. Uh, a human to get enough force to damage a, a really large tree, but um, on medium-sized trees you definitely can. Uh, and uh, the other consideration is if you're doing a really long codominant stem, uh, if you put that cable really high, you'll actually cause the two codominant stems to suck in at the top to the point where the branches on each one are smashing into each other. And um, if they're smashing into each other, you sucked it in way too much. Um, so don't, don't deform the wood. That's basically what it boils into. Um, and you have to know what type of wood you're dealing with. If it's a more flexible wood, you can pull that a little more tighter. tighter. If it's brittle, you gotta um, uh, take it a little easier on that. So what else, what else? Oh, I see. I've got a, a, I've got a good question here. Um, yeah. What do we do about adjusting cables? Should, uh, especially when they're old and bad, should we be in most cases looking to adjust them or replace them with higher cables? What What's the best course of action when dealing with old, yeah, so if already we're, installed yep. stuff? If we're replacing um, or piggybacking onto a pre-existing cabling system, uh, I always come into it if uh, if. The homeowner has told me that it's 15, 20 years old, whatever. Um, I don't think of my system as a supplement to the existing system. Uh, I need my system to be the only thing that's handling the loads uh, because I don't want to build a system on a question mark. And then if something bad happens later, then I look like a dummy going, well, I thought that other cable was going to be holding half the load, so I only use the smaller cable on mine. Um, so sometimes you'll get in a tree and acknowledge that you there was one cable here and you put one way up here and while you were in there you notice this cable is not in that bad of condition it was in the wrong spot it's too low either because it's been in there too long or the last folks that did the cable installation cheated and put it down lower because uh, that was easier for them to do um, and in that case it might be beneficial to leave that cable in there uh, if we're looking at a cable that's old and rusty, not beneficial anymore, um, we will go ahead and cut it off uh, and put everything on our system. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, and then, uh, oh, I see a question, Kayla Wheeler, the difference between a Havens grip and a Chicago grip, I don't know. I found that one on eBay, or uh, we actually found it um, hanging on a telephone pole, and we called DWP to come get it, and they said, ah, just keep it. I think, and maybe Nick, you can correct me. One I know the answer class. to this one. I know Let's the answer. It. Let's hear it. So a Havens grip is easier to use and a little bit cheaper, and usually has a, a little gate that puts that covers it up, but the big difference is, is that it puts a bend in the cable because of the way the camming action works. A Chicago grip, yeah. which requires a little bit more machining and manufacturing to make, uses a parallel cam with two levers that kind of pinch it. So the cable's always straight. And 
Um, I don't know if you know this, Nick, but with rope um, or any kind of tensile thing, when you bend it, uh, you make it weaker, right? Because the outside has to go farther than the inside. And uh, oh. that, that splits the load unevenly on, on whatever that tensile, you know, really? tensile thing is. So um, when you're using the difference between a Chicago's yeah. grip or a Haven's grip, uh, that's what it is. It's ultimate strength. So for most of the purposes that we're using, uh, I think the Haven's grip is probably adequate. It's a little bit cheaper, a little bit lighter. Um, and oh, like I said, okay. it's a little easier to use. But if you were doing long poles or setting high tension cables or like setting a zip line or something, you might want to consider using a Chicago grip. Cool. Uh, Boom, I answered the question. <laughs> yes, Jason Dudek asked a really good question about um, combining cable, steel cable systems in trees that already have or are going to have lightning cable, uh, lightning protection systems installed in them. Um, it's definitely a consideration. Uh, the answer is that it should be okay as long as the lightning protection system is installed properly. Uh, the whole point of the system is to get that electricity, run it through the wires down into the ground. So if your cable is connected to uh, or near to uh, pieces of lightning protection coming down both of the leaders, which is really common, um, theoretically the lightning should hit over here, run down, and then run, continue running down and maybe run across and down uh, into the ground anyway. So it should be okay. Um, let's go to uh, some dynamic cabling now. Um, this is one of my favorite things to do. It's so great to sell dynamic cabling to clients because you can really, it's the folks that are open to it, they love their tree already. And so when you tell them we can do this without drilling a hole in your tree, um, that really resonates with them. And they called you because they want to protect their tree anyways. Uh, the other good thing about dynamic cabling, and then we'll get into a demonstration here, is that the upfront costs are much more minimal. Uh, you can buy, uh, I think Tree Stuff is selling these in 300 foot hanks. Um, you can buy 300 feet of rope. And then all from that point, all you need is a FID, uh, a nice pair of scissors, and a Sharpie and some masking tape and you're good to head up a tree and, and get to work. Uh, buying the drill and all the tools to do steel, you're looking at hundreds and hundreds of dollars, um, which will, you'll get that money back, but it's a less upfront cost. So um, the Tree Care LA dynamic cable bag, uh, we've got a few things in here and my favorite part, well, first of all, it's got a little snap right here that I can hang it onto the branch when, when we get up there. Um, we'll take this off because this is not a good spot for it. It's in our way. And uh, in the front, well, not the very front. In the front, we have some spare tools in case you drop, drop things. But in the second pouch right here, there's a big, huge leather flap. You cannot buy this anywhere. So I'm just showing to share ideas on how to store the tools. And then that fid goes in that sleeve right there. And now all the tools that we need are here. With the exception of the Sharpie, um, everything else is anchored down. The scissors are tied to this tether. So if I need to, I can just drop it. Or if I accidentally drop it, I don't have to worry about that falling on someone on the ground. Um, and then the fit can't be tethered because it needs to be able to go into things. But we do have a backup inside the bag in case we do drop it. So um, let me get. The, yes, this is a Patagonia backpack. Uh, it was very perfect for our setup. And we actually have in the main compartment coming out the, uh, the, the hydration sleeves is uh, the chafe sleeve comes out of here. And then the dynamic cable comes out of that one. We have two sizes inside this bag because um, we do bigger and smaller trees here at Tree Care LA. So they would be run out of here. And up in the tree, you don't need to even open up this pouch. You can just reach over your shoulder, install this cable with the backpack, uh, put the backpack still on, and just swing over to the other side, and the cable will feed out as you're working your way over there. So um, let me grab something real quick. So I have a cable set up here 
already, and it uh, I spliced it to that limb over there already. So what I need to do is to figure out, we're going to cable it right to the same spot right here, figure out how in the heck to, uh, how the heck we're going to do this. So um, we have to do some eyeball measuring here, and I know you guys can't see this part, so I'm going to explain it. When you do a steel cable installation, it should be taut, like a guitar string, perfectly straight when it's done. Dynamic cable will have a little bit of a belly in it. And that belly, as the tree moves in the wind, that belly straightening out, combined with the stretch of the rope itself, is what allows the tree to have some movement, um, to have some movement uh, in moderate wind. And then in heavy winds, it'll go tight, and that's what's going to hold the tree, hopefully, from uh, completely falling. Um, so I know I need. I'm going to give myself two or three feet to put the splice together. So I'm eyeballing this. This is, uh, if you're into rope splicing, you know the measurements are extremely precise sometimes. Um, when we talk about dynamic cable, uh, we acknowledge that you're going to be up in a tree and you're going to be tired and it's going to be 102 degrees and the wind is going to be blowing like crazy. Uh, it can't be precise. So everything's built in knowing that um, we have to have uh, some flexibility in it. So, um, uh, so wow, I sure have this one cut to the right length, so that's great. Um, it, when it's in my backpack, I'll pull it out to the right length, cut it off, and then that gets a little slip knot clipped onto my harness. And then we have to cut the chafe sleeve. So we'll pull a little bit of chafe sleeve out. And uh, this is eyeball here. And we're just pulling. And I want it to be even with the front of the limb, if that makes sense, the side closest to the inside here, um, or extending slightly past that. And I think to better replicate um, anchoring to a larger limb. We'll go around both of these here because that's a good eight inches across. So I would bring this to about right here. It's coming past both of them. Hold on to that spot and snip it with my scissors. <laughs> I just uh, found out that this, this cable that we're using today uh, is called, it's made, it's the Notch brand Dryad. And uh, I would love to tell you to go to Tree Stuff and buy some right now, but they literally just sold out all of it. So it's now on back order. Um, I guess we're doing our jobs the right way in educating and inspiring you guys. Um, so anyways, the chafe sleeve is gonna end up around here. So I'll run this through. Uh, Tree Stuff does have chafe sleeve available. Um, at Tree Care LA, we install enough of this stuff that we get a custom color made because we're really fancy. And um, our chafe sleeve matches the color of our, uh, our rope, so it looks nice and sexy. But the Dryad is a uh, camouflaged look to it. Um, it's a dark brown flex inside. I think it's black. It's hard for me to see it in the lighting, but um, so it'll contrast here a little bit. So that's going to get run around, and then I can just hold it here while I pull it there to get, uh, to get it positioned properly. The chafe sleeve doesn't need to be perfect while you're doing the install. At the end, we can go back and center it. So um, at this point, normally I would have my tools much closer to me, but we'll reach down, and we have to connect the fit. I already taped this already. Um, I think we should. Now, you know, I'm going to leave it right there. We can make a full on tutorial about how to do this splice. Uh, but the idea is to just make a little bit of a taper on the end. I pull out a couple of strands so that it will um, slide through easier. Uh, with a little bit of brute strength, you don't even need to make that good of a taper. So um, if electricians use these types of pullers. Uh, for pulling cables through walls, uh, but Yale has this basket fit. Uh, hey, Nick, do you guys sell the basket fit? Please say yes. Oh, I don't know. He's not there. What the heck? 
Um, oh, the answer is yes. So they do have them. Uh, oh, carrier fit. Yeah, that's that's if you want to find it on their website, get it fast because it's about to go out of uh, go out of sale, uh, go out of stock. But it's made by Yale Cordage, and it says so. It's got the name right on it. Um, so the directions for this splice, uh, I'm not sure if they're, where are the directions published, Nick? You have them right on your website, right? Yep. Yeah. So I'm going to go in uh, right, I'm going to go in right about here and I'm bigger, the bigger the eye, the better. You don't want to make a real tight eye um, that's going to start girdling the branch. Come down pretty far. And if you have a long run, just make a really big eye. Uh, so on this branch right here, I am going down, geez, that's probably a foot and a half that I'm going down here. And uh, your goal is getting this fit through without, uh, you, you don't want to split any of the strands that are inside there. Um, it'll make it hard to pull the fit through. Um, pro tip, this tool wasn't necessarily meant for this job. It's a lot sharper than it needs to be. Grab a file when you buy this and make it a lot blunter. It'll be it'll make it easier for you to pass it through the rope without splitting the strands. It'll be more likely to kind of pop around the strands. So I just hold on to it and pull it and it pulls everything through. And then that's what I can use to set the size of my eye. Um, obviously the tighter I pull it, the smaller the eye will get. So uh, go through the rope, and then I'm going to come through one more time. We only need to go through twice on uh, the dryad rope, and I'm going down six picks. That means you got to count in here one, two, three, four, five, six. On this particular rope, it's about two inches. I can tell you that um, a lot of folks that are installing uh, this style of dynamic cable are, they're not up there counting. Once you do a few of them, you know that it's about that much and you just go through about that much. Um, so that comes through about right there. And so I didn't count, let's see where we're at. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I went seven, but that's gonna be okay. Um, if you're doing a huge discrepancy, that could change things, but you wanna be right in that ballpark. So I'm gonna pull that nice and tight. And keep in mind that I'm doing this while talking about it the whole time. If you're just up in a tree doing this, it goes pretty darn quick. Um, so I'm gonna count down six, one, two, three, four, five, six. And now this part's a little more tricky because you have to travel down the rope. And uh, before I do that, I'm gonna eyeball it. I'm just gonna lay this flat. And um, I like to lay a little mark there. You could actually grab a piece of tape um, and I can put that tape approximately however far down this fit needs to go and that goes there and now I have to work it from inside and it can help if you uh, I'm gonna stretch the eye out to give myself some slack to work with here and then Okay, and then we're going down one fid length. The tail that we want for three quarter inch rope is one fid length, uh, which I think is 19 inches or so. Um, and then this is gonna pop out and I think we can't see, you guys can't see that, right? Yeah, you cannot. So I'm gonna disconnect it over here. And we'll just move the operation a little bit so that you can see. Um, I'm going to pull this out all the way. I'm going to set my eye and I'll put a Sharpie mark on here so that when I pull this, I know what size eye I should have. Um, and then we're going to milk this out and there's going to be a tail at the end and that tail is just going to get stopped cut off the tapered part you won't ever need that again um, and with the dryad it's meant to be adjustable 
And so we're going to leave it like that. And if we ever need to, we can untie, we can come back two years later, untie this stopper knot, let some slack back into the system, stretch out that eye. And uh, if the cable has gone tight because the limbs have gotten heavier and stretched out further, um, we can now put that slack back into the system so we can keep that tree moving and keep this from girdling. Uh, if there's a lot of tension on that, it will start to girdle right here. Even though you put the chafe sleeve, the chafe sleeve isn't there to protect uh, the tree necessarily as much as it is to protect the rope from getting damaged from doing this sort of action up in the wind. Um, so uh, uh, we got to talk a little bit about um, some folks want to know when to use the dynamic cable. It's when you want movement, but you want to restrict the movement. Uh, hey, Brendan and Taylor, I see what you're saying. So sorry about that, but uh, I'll hold it up here so you guys can see the end result is the tail runs down and then there's a knot at the end. This will get cut off and uh and then you'll just have a tail you could leave a one foot tail give yourself some extra room to work with in the future so that's the end result and then it usually will have about that much wobble in it um, it's not perfectly tight uh, it's got a little bit of flex to it if you were to stand on it right here it'll hold you um, that tail is going to bite down real hard and grab on uh, to keep it from slipping um, so um, dynamic cable is when you need movement, you want movement, but you want to slow down that movement. Um, let's see. Uh, hey, Doug, that's a really good question. Can this system be installed on a, a very smooth stem? Um, in Southern California, eucalyptus, uh, some of them are really smooth. Uh, we've got one called a lemon uke, which smells amazing, and you could probably guess what it smells like. Um, and it feels like somebody polished it. And when we use it on those trees, we're more, we notice um, a little bit of, of the cambium not getting damaged, but it's starting to cut, not cut in, but where the new wood is starting to grow around, uh, around that limb. So we watch it more closely uh, and be ready to go up and set uh, to expand the system a little bit after a few years, but these should be inspected anyway. Steel and dynamic cables should be inspected regularly, and it's a good way to keep that connection uh, with the, the client. Um, uh, Aaron, you make a good point. I thought the type of crotch dictated the type of cable. You're right. So when I'm saying you want to keep that movement, that means we acknowledge that there isn't a lot of included bark going on down below uh, and it seems like it can hold itself together, but we want to add a little more precaution. So, um, uh, Brendan, for, to answer your question, I think that picture you sent in, I would probably go steel cable on it just because it's so huge. Um, and I would say rods would be recommended uh, on that one, but it didn't look to me like it was opening up at all so the rods would be there more as a, um, uh, to hedge our bets and make things uh, feel a little bit safer. But when I look at the pictures you sent in, Brendan, of that big tree, and I think that's the one you had the tire swing hanging off of, um, to me, that tree says uh, cable is sufficient. One, I'd probably do one 3 8 inch diameter cable Nick, um, based on what I could tell from the picture. Nick, I have a question. Uh, Carson has a yeah. great photo that uh, Ray Gleason sent in of a, butter, a historic butternut tree that failed. Uh, and Carson will put that up. But my question is, when you are selling cables and um, dynamic or static to people, you talked a little bit about going back and inspecting them. Is that something that you include in the cost of your cabling? Or do you sell an additional package that includes regular inspections? And if so, at what cost? Uh, that's a really good question for every time someone asks something, I always say, that's a really good question. Um, uh, <coughs> excuse me. We don't include that in the price of the installation. Uh, what we, we sell for the basic cable installation, uh, 350 bucks. If it's a straightforward one, that's for us to come out, put the cable in, show it to you. A lot of times clients need to be shown where it is and give you a high five and we go on our way um, and then we encourage the client to contact us in perhaps three years 
and we plan for us to contact them. We want them to contact us first. Uh, that helps us know, um, A, it saves us from, from having to run them down uh, to do it. But we don't go back out there for free. Uh, we charged you, to, the thought of 350 bucks for me to come out to your house and, and, or one of our guys you know, to send the crew, that's not a lot of money. Um, and if you're doing just one cable, we might charge more because it's just one cable. Um, so if, uh, if you want to do, if you want to go back out there, charge them a small fee, charge them 50 bucks for you to go out there and just look at it and make sure everything looks up to, up to date. Um, if, can you guys do me a favor, hit one of those like buttons or the love button or, or, uh, one of those, I like seeing them all pop up. It makes me feel good. Um, but, uh, just hit like if you like 50 bucks. Yeah. If you like 50 bucks, um, 50 bucks to go check on the cable. Oh yeah. That's a good idea. Like for the idea of charging money to go back out there. Um, you might remember the client and say, gosh, I'm willing to go out there again for free because they got a lot of amazing trees and I might be able, wow, look at all those likes. Oh my gosh. That's so cool. Uh, who did the rainbow flag? No, no offense. Um, that's really crazy to see. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to sit here and watch them. Um, but the, the way we do it in our company is we would, we're a small company and we can't necessarily contact every single person. And in Los Angeles, properties change hands so often. Um, there's a really significant chance that three years later, they don't even live there anymore, but a quick, a quick email. That's a lot of likes. Um, uh, a quick email can go a long way. So, uh, who else has some, some questions? I think we've got a little more time. I don't mind staying later. Um, Oh, let me show one, one thing. I think we're done talking about dynamic cabling. I do want to point out there are a lot of, uh, or several other dynamic cabling systems. The Cobra system was the one that sort of, uh, made this commonplace. Um, I think it's too intricate. I just don't bother with that one because I think this style of one single sleeve, one piece of chafe sleeve and one splice, uh, I think that's a really great setup. So that's what I go for. Let's talk a little bit just for a minute or two about installing props. Um, this is the, ooh, sorry. Uh, this is the official tree care LA, uh, prop. And all it is, is a four by four piece of steel. We have a plate welded. Let me get this. We have a plate welded on the top and at the very top is uh, a nut that's welded on. Uh, it's all waterproof up here, which is really important because it's going to be out in the elements. And we're just putting a piece of threaded rod through there. And when we get out to the property um, to spec it out, we've got a whole bunch of these in stock, all different sizes. Uh, some of them are two inch for smaller limbs and then the four inch ones uh, obviously can handle much bigger loads. Um, if we're doing a horizontal limb, don't use, uh, regardless of what type of limb, if you're installing a prop, the traditional technique is to make a cradle of some sort and then rest the tree in that cradle. And um, there have been tree failures that have failed at the point of the cradle because after a decade or so, uh, the tree gets girdled at that point and you end up with decay and then it makes a good snap point. It's not like you're perforating that limb. Um, so this technique with just a piece of threaded rod allows you to drill one hole. Uh, if we're doing, let's say a 10 inch limb, we'll go up maybe three inches and get this thing into position and just start, grab this with a pair of, uh, uh, vice grips and just start twisting. It. And that mechanical advantage right here, you'll actually be able to lift that limb up a lot. So what we typically do is lift the limb up first with something else. Uh, because this will allow you to lift it up. That rod goes down two feet into this post. Um, so if you have two feet of rod sticking out the top, it just kind of looks dumb. And I don't know if it's that strong laterally, if the wind is pushing it. So we want to keep this section short. So we'll lift it with something else, measure everything out, um, and then install the prop and start winding it up until it's pushing, until this pushes the limb 
off of the original thing we were using to lift it up with. Uh, to anchor this at the base, um, there are kind of three ways you can do it. Uh, if you're lucky enough to be near a concrete pad, maybe it's on the edge of a driveway or a patio, uh, then you can just have a plate at the bottom or use some L brackets, drill some holes into the concrete and just bolt it straight in with some concrete anchors. Um, wow, those lights just keep on pouring in. That's so, so awesome. <laughs> Oh, yes. Uh, you can never go wrong with five guys. I like that you can throw the peanut shells right on the floor. Um, uh, where was I? If you don't have concrete down below, the traditional method is to dig a hole, mix up some concrete, put it in the hole, set the prop in the concrete, uh, wait for it to cure, and then do this installation. Um, we don't use concrete at Tree Care LA. We need to travel light. So we have this weird uh, product here. It's called Secure Secure Set. We buy it on Amazon. Let me see. I'll hold that up right there. Um, and it's a, it's basically an epoxy, a foam style epoxy. Uh, it's two bottles, and I cannot open it up right now because I don't have a knife on me. What the heck? Um, whatever. It's two bottles. We'll show you right here. Okay, sorry about that. Um, you're going to hear some noise in the background. That's the Tree Care LA crew uh, showing up. They've had a long day. It's six, six o'clock. Okay, and we'll probably we'll see if we can get some of them on screen. But uh, so this is what Secure Set looks like. Kind of a cheesy box, but you open it up, and there's a little tiny bottle of Part A and then a big bottle with a bunch of empty space in it for part B. You pour these two in, one into the other, and uh, stir it a little bit, pour that into the hole, and it expands. I think it, it, it expands 30 to 1. So if you make a hole this big, you only need to fill it in that deep. And over the next 20 minutes, it just really blows up. And it just needs to grab onto the post. It doesn't have to support the whole weight of the tree. It just needs to grab onto the post enough. Um, we'll usually put a wooden plate or something down at the bottom uh, so that we don't have to sit there and wait for it to fully cure. Um, but it makes the installation super duper easy. Um, so uh, let's open it up to uh, some more questions, whether it be about props or cables or anything else. Um, one thing I didn't mention about the uh, through rod installation, it's very straightforward. Once you drill the hole, you put the through rod in, um, and then washers and uh, one or two nuts on, on both sides, and then cut it off almost flush, cut the through rod off using a, a grinder works best, and then peen over the edges uh, so that those nuts can't back off. Uh, we have a really neat tool I'll show you. It's a hammer. It's not a hammer. That's what that's uh, what peening is, in case anybody wants to know. It's just you hitting the edges so that it so that it can't turn. Hit the like button if you just use a hammer for that. <laughs> After you cut a piece of threaded rod, you might have a four foot piece, but you only need two feet. You cut it off with a grinder. It messes up the threads there a little bit. So um, uh, one of our arborists found out, he showed me this, uh, Oscar showed me this, that you can thread uh, a, a nut on, cut it, and then when you back that thread off, it'll put the threads back together uh, when you back that nut off, and so that totally works. I found this little guy right here. It's called a Uniburr. Uh, it goes on to the end of your drill, and... All you do, use the big guy right here. Let's say this has been cut and damaged, and I think we need to go right about there. And hopefully this doesn't spin and clock me in the face. But uh, it's got some. It's like a pencil sharpener, and all it does is lightly sharpen the end of the rod, and it makes it so that you can back these things off. Obviously, it's going to go real smooth right now, but. Um, you can thread this right back on 
real easily. So it saves us a lot of time of guys on the job site trying to thread a, a nut two feet down a piece of rod before cutting it. They can just put this thing on there. Uh, I think we paid like 20 bucks for it on Amazon. Uh, it's Uniber, U-N-I-B-U-R-R. -R. That's what the packaging looks like right there. And that's what the drill bit looks like. It's a funny little ice cream cone sort of looking thing. Um, that's so a, That's very anyways. cool. We've got a couple of questions for you. Yeah, let's uh, hear Kayla it. Wheeler's got a great question, or I'm sorry. Kayla Wheeler responded. Ethan Bradley has a great question. Um, how do you cover liability if the stem were to fail after installing a cabling system? And I think this applies to any of the, the kind of proactive treatments you talked about here. Yeah, totally. So um, that's a really tough situation. And it all starts with the, uh, hold on. Let me see if Pedro wants to come on screen real quick. Pedro, you're wanted on screen. The entire they, internet. They want the internet wants to say hi. He said, "Oh shit." <laughs> um, uh, watch all the cables as you're walking over here. Uh, Let's see how many and, likes Pedro gets when he gets on screen. Yeah, I think we need to see how many likes Pedro's gonna get. Um, I want to give it up for this guy. It is about six o'clock right now. Oh, He's had man. a long day. Come on in, Pedro. Say hi to everyone. Um, this is one of our climbers, certified arborist. Uh, Pedro, how long have you been working with us? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. And uh, what would you guys do today? Two Mexican fan palms, a uh, pepper tree, and a mulberry tree. Is it awkward standing here with your arm around your boss? Yeah, <laughs> sometimes. All right, thanks, thanks Pedro. Sometimes. Um, they had a big job on a super steep hillside today, so uh, uh, it was a long day for them. Longer than you thought it was going to be, right? Longer than what I thought yeah. it was going to be. Uh, the webinar will be waiting for you when you get home. Awesome, uh, I can't wait. <laughs> um, all right. All right, later. Uh, liability is a huge, it's the primary concern. Uh, you're acknowledging that the tree needs to be addressed risk-wise, and you're intervening to mitigate that risk. So right off the bat, you're in sketchy waters because uh, you start by saying the tree was risky. Um, so first and foremost, it starts verbally with a client. They have to understand the procedure, um, the, the, the lineup here that, that I can't guarantee your tree is never going to fail. There's nothing we can do to ever guarantee that. And if they're not comfortable with that verbally, just stop right there. It's not going to work out and, and something bad's going to happen and you're going to end up in court when that fails finally one day. Um, when you can tell verbally that, that this is a, a good relationship, then you have in writing on your work, uh, your quote that you present to them, it's a contract. And that contract says what you told them verbally. It's not a guarantee that it'll never fail. We're using the best techniques we have available. Um, and we're using our experience and judgment as an arborist to determine the best way to do this. We acknowledge that we focus on the good things here. We acknowledge that we're minimizing the risk. But then we also address that um, uh, that there are limitations and Tree Care LA will not be liable for blah, 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 and encourage um, in writing regular inspections. Um, in, in our quote, we, rec we recommend annual inspections. That way it really puts it on them to say, you're required to contact our office annually to schedule a reinspection. As soon as they don't call you, it's kind of like you're off the hook. So um, it's a little, yeah, yes. A little CYA, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> to summarize, a little client education, a little CYA statement, and insurance. Yes, absolutely. You better be insured. And this is really important. Make sure that your insurance company actually covers uh, cabling, or sometimes it'll say the repair or the mechanical repair of trees. Make sure, because a lot of insurance companies that deal with tree services only handle trimming and removal and it'll say that in your policy pop it open and read it and make sure it says trimming the removal and the repair of trees and um, we've pushed our insurer to make sure they took out the word repair and specified cable bracing propping uh, because we didn't want any 
ambiguity that we weren't covered for something that we thought we were covered, uh, where they could say, well, that's not what we meant by the word repair. So um, have that conversation. Uh, what else? What else? We're gonna we're gonna post the uh, the quiz for the CEUs now. Um, I'm, I've got one more question, and then I'm gonna take it back from you back here to India. I want to tell people about a discount code that we have uh, for everything. I'll remind some people about a sale that's going on. Uh, talk about uh, deals on cabling gear and, and some of our events. So uh, one last question is, and I got this from a few people. Some people texted me. I saw it in the chat. But can you talk a little bit about Aimanize? Uh, what their place is and, and when it, or when you might not use those. Yeah, uh, Aim and Eyes, uh, they, they really make a big point about teaching this in the Certified Arborist exam. Um, in the, before the Rig Eye system came along, uh, JLAGs were the predominant way, uh, JLAGs and through bolts. JLAGs are used in uh, younger wood where it's more likely to compartmentalize and, and really grab onto uh, the JLAG. And then a through bolt is if there's a little bit of decay or if you think it's a type of wood that isn't going to handle that drill hole very well, um, then we were encouraged to drill a hole all the way through, put a through bolt all the way that has an eye on one side, and then you can put washers and bolts on the back side. Uh, there is a point at which you can't find an eye bolt that's three feet long if that, that's what you need. Uh, so you can get an aim and eye, which is just an eye only with a threaded section on it, and you can cut a custom cut piece of bolt, slide that in through the hole, and then screw on the aim and eye. So you can kind of make your own uh, make your own bolts. So it functions identically as, or it serves the same purpose as a, a an eye bolt uh, with a few extra steps that give you a lot of extra function out of it. Um, but all the same considerations need to be made. If you're dealing with a decayed stem, that has you have to go through that point. Uh, put some bigger washers on the backside um, if that's appropriate. So, um, uh, Justin Justin Grigo made a really good point. Justin made a really good point. Cables and rods are not absolute. It's a support system. It's here to help. That's a really good way to put it. Um, I think I'm going to send it back over to the folks over at Tree Stuff. I want to thank all of you guys for watching and for sending all your likes. Um, this has been a really neat experiment for us to do across the country uh, to put this together. And, and I want to thank you guys for cooperating and, and going along for the ride. And I hope you learned something out of it. And uh, if you have more questions about it, I invite you to hit me up on Facebook and send those questions. It's something I'm really passionate about. I would love to save every tree in the world if we could. And in the urban environment, this is a really good way to do that. So uh, keep your eyes peeled for opportunities where you can save trees, make clients happier, and make yourself some money in the process. So good luck with everything. And uh, back to you, Nick. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, thanks for everyone for joining in. Uh, I am incredibly pleased that we were able to pull this off. Uh, we have been talking a lot here in the Tree Stuff office about ways to expand our webinar series and different things that we can do to bring exciting content to the masses. And the limitations of bringing speakers in was one of the things that was hindering us. And uh, Nick agreed to be our remote guinea pig. And overall, uh, I think we, we battled some techn technical problems uh, during the setup of this. But we got it to work really, really well. Uh, and the last two hours went, went awesome. And, uh, this opens up a whole new avenue for us. Uh, I've got interest from Joe Harris, uh, who's on the other side of the world to participate. Taylor Hamill wants to do a live broadcast from a tree. Uh, so that, those are both slated for August. So the program is really expanding, and it, it wouldn't be expanding without uh, people like you, Nick, or uh, the people at home that are watching it. Nick, can you give me a high five? Three, two, one, boom. I hope that worked. Um, it didn't work, Carson's saying. Uh, Again, thank you to everyone who watched. Thank you to Carson, who's at the Sticks. Uh, Brandon, who was helping out on the chat tonight. I uh, really appreciate that. We've got a sale on all things cabling. We did our best to include everything on the site. Uh, if it isn't included, and it should be, uh, you know, just put it in your order comments, and we'll have Joe take care of you. But the discount code is CABLE. Uh, what's it good for, Carson? 15% 15 15 off all the cabling supplies, tools, uh, and accessories. So uh, that discount code is CABLE. Uh, we also have our Yale sale going on right now, which is 15% off all the Yale stuff. Uh, and that code is YaleZilla. If you watch this in a year, those codes won't work, so don't try them. Uh, I want to invite everyone to Jambo 
four, Jambo four, our fourth year of doing the world's biggest, best, and most fun tree climbing competition. So we have 80 climbers coming in from all over the world to compete in our four events this year. We have wild and crazy rigging challenges with Rock Exotica, crazy technical stuff with DMM, and the biggest job site challenges that anyone's ever seen. Uh, our event runs this year in four person events. Uh, it's two two man teams, man and woman teams that combine. Uh, and we put you know upwards of 30 and 40 bells in uh, a, a large groups of trees. So if you'd like to come see a climbing competition or participate in games, we have charity games with cash prizes, kids events, uh, all sorts of stuff that's going on. There's climbs, uh, it's free to attend. We've got camping back here at Tree Stuff where we throw a really big rager and sell a bunch of stuff out of the garage door. It should be a really, really good time. So that's July 14th, 15th, and 16th here in Indianapolis at Holiday Park. Please do come. Uh, I want to thank my, my good friend Nick Araya. Or is he still next to me, Carson? Did you move him? He's not. I want to thank my good friend Nick Araya for coming. Uh, and, and doing this with us. Nick was with us at uh, 9 a.m. this morning, again at 4 p.m. And it really gave a, a ton of time to make this happen. We don't pay him or anything, thank God. Um, and uh, it, it worked out super, super duper well. So uh, thank you to everyone and um, keep tree stuff weird. We're out.